four million years later. Hi there, thank you for downloading and listening to and subscribing to the 4 Million Years Later podcast, a show where two friends get together and watch a Transformers episode and then get together and talk about the Transformers episode. Uh, Transformers Generation 1 from the 1980s. Uh, my name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Hoover. I'm back. I'm still here. I'm not leaving. Three times in, you're still here. We'll see how if you can make it all the way to 98. <laughs> it's going to be a while, but let's make it happen. <laughs> so, episode three, More Than Meets the Eye, part three, the conclusion to the original miniseries before we even knew it was going to be a regular series, when it was just a, what was it, a week-long television event it is a big deal. I mean, that's something that I used to talk about in an old show that uh, I used to do called the Saturday Supercast. But like when cartoons were on, not on Saturday mornings, that was like a big deal. A special you time. Know? Everyone gathered yeah. around the television. To the point where when I missed one, I would, I, would, I would be devastated because like this was pre-VCRs for most people, right? And if you didn't, mm -hmm. or even if you had a VCR, if you didn't tape it, it's just not, you're not going to see it again. Nope. You don't know when it's going to come back. I mean, the TV guide only goes until next month. It was anarchy back then. <laughs> it was anarchy. It was like Mad Max, but for entertainment. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, so this was an exciting day when this episode aired. More Than Meets the Eye Part 3. When we last left off, Optimus was rolling down a hill, <laughs> apparently injured or dead. Bumblebee and Sparkplug dead. Roller dead. Decepticons dead. <laughs> and we're left, we're left with Jazz just screaming prime. So what happens? How do they wrap this up? How do they conclude this epic, uh, what would it be, like 60-minute miniseries? <laughs> uh, let's, let's read the synopsis, shall we? The Autobots make one last stand to stop the Decepticons from returning to Cybertron. Hmm, I guess they all didn't die after all. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> Good thing that they don't uh, start with the synopsis of the episode. Instead, we get Victor Caroli. Mm-hmm. Our man who is synonymous with Transformers, who has the voice of Transformers. He fills us in on the events of the previous two episodes, just in case you missed him. And he brings us up to speed with Prime tumbling down the mountains sideways in truck mode. Doesn't look very comfortable. <laughs> Doesn't look very comfortable. So the Autobots rush in to help once he crashes down. And they roll him back up on his tires. And Prime slowly regains consciousness. And Prime being Prime, what is the first thing he asks about? Prime, can you hear me? Oh, oh. He's still generating. Roller. What, what happened to him? Down but not out. Roller's one tough little Autobot. Prime, can you transform? I, I'll try. I... I don't know if I can do it. Uh, I've almost got it. Yeah, so I I really, like, I love Peter Collins' performance of Optimus Prime in this first miniseries because mm -hmm. as we talked about, he's a little, he's he sounds like a younger Optimus. He's got, like, just slightly younger than he is in the next season, right? Like, stick it in neutral, Megatron. You're, you're junk, that's all you are. But, like, this moment where he's like, Prime, are you all right? And he's like, oh, uh, you know, like that that vulnerable little groan that he mm -hmm. does. You don't get to hear that very often later on. No, he's right? he's too well put together in the subsequent season one and after that. But in this in this miniseries particularly, he feels more rougher around the edges. He feels like he's not quite ready to be a boss yet. Yeah, yeah, I, I. I as a fan of Rodimus, I'm big, I, I find that very exciting. And also, a uh, little art note, there's a lovely little piece of animation when they're rolling Prime onto his wheels and Ratchet is holding the cab. And when it finally lands on its wheels, there's this little rock that they do with Optimus. Mm. He doesn't just go plop and then he's flat in his wheels. Like, he does this little wobble to show, like, and it just, it's, it's a little thing, but it gives him a sense of weight. You yeah. feel how heavy it was or how hard it was for those Autobots to flip him over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes so, the animation is not so great in this series. Or other times, it's really <laughs> spectacular. Yeah, well, I, maybe it's that, again, you know, up until this point, we really weren't used to getting a whole lot 
of like really excellent animation in serialized televised animation, right? Um, we got good animation, but not mm-hmm. excellent, not like uh, uh, animated film animation, right? You know, like when, when you watch like the the Alvin and the Chipmunks cartoon versus the Chipmunks movie, it's like holy cow, it's mm-hmm. it's worlds apart. So like when we got these little things, like I, I remember it just excited me as a young person, especially as a young person who was really interested in art. So, you know, Ratchet, who finally we get some like you know proper lines out of, he's like. Prime, can you transform? I and mean, that's the first thing they always ask if you get hurt. Can you transform? Mm-hmm. For God's sakes, make sure you could do that. And this part is really cool because, I mean, is is very memorable to me as a child when when he's just having so much trouble transforming, and he he's just like groaning and moaning, and he's it's such it's such an effort for him to be able to transform. And it just like really stuck with me, like just that whole performance. And again, I think it's Wally Burr pulling a great performance out of these people. Not that they weren't already great voice actors, but you mm-hmm. know, you can you can, you know, be lazy and, and not give your best and just get the job done. But Peter Cullen here is just like Aah! you really feel it. But- <laughs> when I saw Peter Cullen at BotCon 1997, uh, he, he did specifically point out that uh, Wally Bird made everybody's throats raw with all the grunting he asked of everybody. <laughs> That's exactly what Jersey does to me on this podcast. He's like, Hoover, you weren't feeling that. We're going we're gonna to pause. We're going to retake it. <laughs> oh, for God's sake, just, just do it like this. Just do it like this. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but yeah, this is a lovely scene too because not only do you get to see like the full transformation in slow motion, um, you get to see like the hand, the the, the um, headlights slide into his forearms and the mm-hmm. hands come out in slow motion. But then you have this this really nice scene where the Autobots are cheering him on. Yeah, and it's uh, it's also happens to be the first time we see Gears speak, and Gears has just been in the background and he uses infrared the one time. But uh, yeah. he's voiced here by Don Messick, who is also the voice of Ratchet. So he's kind of a, I would say, a very similar voice. There's not a lot of difference between the two. And maybe mm-hmm. that's why we don't hear Gears speak all that often. But uh, this is the first time we hear it. He's cheering yes. on Prime uh, along with Bumblebee and somebody else. Something we didn't talk about last time when Wheeljack and uh, Sparkplug were interacting when they are talking about that bomb is that Chris Lott is playing both characters, and his wheeljack normally is very close to um, Sparkplug's voice, but you hear him change the performance just a little bit because they're talking to each other. Like he he, he takes wheeljack and takes him more into like gung ho from GI Joe mm-hmm. than where he was in the beginning of the very first episode. So it's it's funny how it's not a small cast, right? It's by no means a filmation cast of voice actors, but. Right. Everybody does enough voices that there's going to be a, an opportunity for them to have a conversation with one another, with themselves, mm-hmm. right? Especially like, if any Decepticon do? is talking to any other Decepticon. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I mean, we we've, we've touched on it before, but Frank Welker is literally what all but two of the first season Decepticons. Uh, three, three, uh, three. Thundercracker, That's right. Thundercracker, Starscream, and Reflector. Well, and Shockwave. So oh, yeah, if you four. count Shockwave. Who's stuck on Cybertron? <laughs> yeah, Frank still Wilker's waiting. every other Decepticon but them. So, but uh, thankfully, he's a great voice artist, and sometimes you can't even tell it's all the same guy. Yeah. No, I certainly didn't know until way later. It wasn't until I watched the ending credits of the Transformers movie that mm-hmm. I started that I realized, mm-hmm. like, oh my gosh, one guy did all those guys. Yeah. That's how good he is, but because um, yeah, and, and we were the kind of kids who listened for that. Like, mm-hmm. oh wait, you know, you, when you listen to Ironhide and you listen to Optimus, they sound a little bit alike. Yeah, you know. And then wait a minute, Streetwise from the Protectobot sounds an awful lot like Optimus, but like he's grunting. <laughs> you know? Okay, so he slowly transforms. The Autobots are cheering him on, and then he's like, "All right, I'm I'm back," and he he's in robot mode, and apparently that's all he needed to do to fix himself. And then, what was, who is it? Is it Ratchet? He's like, that was some blast you took. Mm-hmm. And then Optimus says, the blast. That's right. I had <laughs> friends in there. Bumblebee and Sparkplug, they're still inside. So they have to rescue Bumblebee and Sparkplug from the cave-in. And so they automatically have these very convenient drills and everything. So Ironhide starts drilling through the wall. I also just like that Ironhide, the guy who made a new river, is like, well... 
Yep. We just, we dig them out. You know, we, whatever's in our way, we just move it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I'm a minivan. Okay. <laughs> you're, and you're an awesome minivan. Iron Hyde, you're the best minivan. Uh, so yeah, he, it, it, instead of his hand going into his forearm, a drill like comes out of his forearm, mm-hmm. out of the top of it and start digging. And they all start digging. And conveniently enough, they find Bumblebee and Sparkplug rather quickly, and they're they're just fine. They just had rocks on top of them. That's all. So they, they well, get them out. I thought and, it, I thought it was animated in such a way that it looked like Bumblebee was like protecting Sparkplug with his body. Well, probably so. I mean, that's Bumblebee for you. I know he's so good. <laughs> <laughs> he cares about everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody's reunited, and the Autobots are all together. And now we get some dialogue. With the Decepticons buried under all that rock, we can resume our search for the resources we need. And we can return to Cybertron? Very soon, Mirage. Very soon. Yeah, so Mirage obviously has a goal in mind. So we can go back to Cybertron? (laughs) Yeah. Mirage, calm down. We still have to defeat the Decepticons. (laughs) Well, how about we go back to the Cybertron first? Uh, the Decepticons <laughs> aren't there. Mirage, calm that's down. Pretty, that's a pretty good Gregory Peck. <laughs> so Mirage is the type of person who never takes vacations. And when you finally take him on a vacation, he's like, can we go home now? Are we done? <laughs> he, was like, he was like young Hoover whenever his mom took him to a clothes store when he was about seven. <laughs> it's like, are we done it's time yet? Time to go school shopping. Yeah. Look at these dungarees. Oh, look, it's your animals. You can match the shirt and the pants. Can we go home now? <laughs> yes, I talk like that, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's why that character appeals to you. Well, I mean, they're they're really emphasizing this idea that he, he you know, uh, in what was it, in the second episode, he says, like, well, let's just forget about everything that's going on here. Just go home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I feel like this is them leading some breadcrumbs to how this episode ends. Totally. Right? Completely, yeah. So, uh, but very, very soon, Mirage, very soon, and all of a sudden, the mountain explodes. You hear a big commotion, and a hole is blown in the top of the cave, causing Ironhide to exclaim what apparently is his catchphrase, because this is the second time in the series he's ever said it, leaking lubricants. Ugh, I wish he would have kept using it. (laughs) That's a great one. I I think the problem with that is that I mean, this being the first miniseries, it was obviously written before any of the other stories, but Mm -hmm. it probably wasn't so far along in production that the other writers of the other episodes were given this script to sort of like Mm -hmm. continue the trends and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So they probably just had no idea of what to you know, make a recurring theme because they hadn't read the previous scripts and so many of the season one scripts were all written by different people. So it kind of wasn't set up for recurring themes in that way. Yeah, that that is one of the pitfalls of having a, a project where you have that many voices in there, right? You, mm-hmm. get, you get some wonderful inconsistencies that lead to imagination. Yeah. And we'll talk more about Starscream in particular and how different writers portrayed him. But... One thing you lose is that yeah, after this miniseries, we get no more vehicular puns, and we don't get any more of like these cute little uh, idiomatic expressions, <laughs> which uh, leak and lubricants. I just lo- I just love that idea that like that a swear is like oh my arm is bleeding <laughs> 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 because that's how idiomatic expressions are right like ach du mm. lieber like literally means like oh my love you know or something mm. like that like I think I think that's close to the literal translation if I remember my high school German but it, like it really means like oh for heaven's sake or something like that mm. yeah the only German I know is what I gleaned off of Nightcrawler in the X Men comics so not much unglaublich. <laughs> yeah okay so so he's leak lubricants and then we go to the hole blown in the mountain we look down and we hear what is it sky warp we're free we can, we get, can get out, out. <laughs> yeah that's what we're free means <laughs> <Sky Warp. laughs> well he's used because to being he's... in the air he doesn't like being cramped down on the ground i know he's excited so the Decepticons manage to free themselves from the cave and they begin to fly off in typical Decepticon fashion. They get what they want and they just leave. This is another thing that like the age I was, 
I remember this line hitting me because I was taking everything very literally. Like, okay, all the characters are always telling the truth and they're not speaking figuratively. Mm. So when Megatron says, we are indestructible, I'm like, oh my God, no. <laughs> <laughs> As a kid, I'm like, well, then how can the good guys win if the bad guys are indestructible? It didn't even occur to me as a child that he was just bragging. <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> It's one of those things that I lear- like. I realized way later after watching it like 100 and 150 times. Uh, slow on the uptake, this kid. But yeah, I, 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 I thought that was a, like a shocking line. Like, oh no, the story just changed. <laughs> They're indestructible. <laughs> and then they, like the Energon cubes are okay. Everything's okay. Well, let's get out of here. And they all fly away. But of course, Ironhide has something to say about that. The Decepticons, they're escaping. After them! They're save it, Ironhide. They're too fast for us in the air. Well, I'm tired of sucking their vapor trail. I'll stop them. Ironhide, come back! I'll get him! Blue Streak, no! Yeah, so wh- what kind of an army is this? What kind of discipline is going on here, Autobots? Well, they're not fighters like the Decepticons are, Hoover. (laughs) Okay, Hoover. Yeah, the Autobots have a total lack of military discipline. Not only does Ironhide Mm. go off without uh, getting permission, but Blue Streak goes after him without getting permission, and Jazz is just left here going, dang it, I'm (laughs) supposed to be whipping you guys into shape for Prime here, and you're making me look bad. (laughs) <laughs> so this is one of those things that I feel like really roots it in the time it was written in that, remember, this is early to mid 80s, Reagan America, you know, it's the US of A versus those red commies. It, I don't know if you how well you remember this, Hoover, but that was it was actually a pretty scary time, not like Cuban Missile Crisis scary, but I remember seeing on television our president talking about the evil Soviet empire and how we have to you know, uh, defend ourselves against them. And there was like a lot of war rhetoric in the early eighties. And so you have to imagine that anybody writing a television series, whether it's for kids or adults, that they're going to be of their time. Their time is going to inform their work. And so you look at it through that lens, that, that lens of history. And it's like, okay, yeah, the Autobots are ragtag, but they're individualists. Everybody's an individual and everybody acts out of their own center. And maybe that's disruptive and maybe it causes like unnecessary dangers, but that's what you sign on for in the U S of a, right? Like we're the (laughs) revolutionary war people, right? We're the people who said no representation without taxation. And we picked a fight with a much bigger dude, right? (laughs) Whereas the Decepticons, what happens? Ironhide and blue street take off and like, you know, no military discipline here. We're all acting out of our own agency, but then we go to the Decepticons, you know, Ironhide's flying along and blue streaks like call it off Ironhide. He's like, like, stop yapping blue streak this is my fight and he's like well okay make it our fight <laughs> you you're very persuasive iron height <laughs> now they're both yeah, fighting it, i mean you could interpret that as the fact that blue streak just wanted to go with iron hide too and he <laughs> left under the illusion of oh i'll stop him optimus wink wink yeah <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I tried. Yeah. I tried, but he's just such a smooth talker that iron hide. <laughs> um so then they, they fire on the Decepticons and they hit, mm-hmm. like this gun comes out of Ironhide's back and he shoots and he hits Skywarp in the tail fin. Now, now remember what I just said about like the Autobots all being like a, a group of individualists, so all act out of their own center with their own agency. And so Skywarp, part of this very militaristic Decepticons, goes what? <laughs> this is such a great scene because Skywarp is shot, literally shot. He doesn't just react to that. He request permission from Megatron to teleport and go deal with the people who shot him. Yeah. Request permission to retaliate. Right. So like that's, that's, the, that's the distinction that's being drawn here, right? The Autobots are, are the, the ragtag revolutionaries and the Decepticons are the brutal totalitarian militaristic organization where even if you get injured, you have to look to the boss to say, can I do something about that, please? You know, <laughs> And then, and then the boss says, permission granted, teleport and destroy. And now we get to see Skywarp actually use his superpower for mm-hmm. what? One of the, is this the only time we ever see him do it? No, I think there's one or two other times. But okay. maybe we should count them as we go. That's one. I wonder if there's any robot around who wants to count them. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> 
I know an especially uh, subservient Decepticon who might be able to keep count for mm. us. Well, we'll see. So Skywarp teleports. That's one. And he ends up behind Ironhide and Blue Streak. And uh, he finishes them off pretty well and sends Ironhide and Blue Streak both careening back to Earth. Ha ha ha. So they go crashing down. But uh, conveniently, they crash down pretty much right where they took off from somehow. So the Autobots <laughs> are there to uh, help them up when they crash. I can't move. At least you can still talk, old buddy. Where'd you get hit? Back in somewhere. Think my linkage is busted. I'll check it. Get him inside. <laughs> Gave us all a pretty good scare. It's been worse. I remember the time on Cybertron. Save the war stories, Hotshot. Just remember there's a thin line between being a hero and being a memory. <laughs> Maybe Ironhide's ready for a nice, cushy office job. Hey, no way. Soon as Ratchet tightens a few bolts, I'll be right back in action. We'll see. Let's get out of here. So, uh, what do you think of Optimus's first draft of the <laughs> iconic call to move? I'm just imagining, like, it's been a great battle, and the Autobots are all weary. And uh, they save the day, though, because it's what the Autobots do. And then at the end of the day, Optimus transforms and says, Let's get out of here! <laughs> just doesn't really have the same uh just just keep working on it optimus keep working on it <laughs> uh i i knew this autobot named rat trap who once said let's get out of here <laughs> i know i know rat trap came after optimus Prime. <laughs> <laughs> So somebody somebody had steam coming out of their ears just now. Uh, so so like let's get out of here and then they all head for home for repairs because uh, poor Ironhide's all banged up. And then we cut to Spike who is speeding up the story with a little bit more exposition. <laughs> uh, Spike's writing in his diary again. <laughs> and he thinks Optimus Prime is neat and that he'd make a great president. <laughs> well... <laughs> I like the Tin Man. Uh, I would so be friends with Spike if I was a kid now. <laughs> like if I if I could be a kid again, I'd want to be friends with Spike, and I'd be like, you know what, you're right. Can we let's let's sit down together and just like write lists about how how neat Optimus is. <laughs> <laughs> and then like so while Spike's writing in his journal and just contemplating how neat Optimus is because he is, um, we get to Ravage who is in a cage and. Uh, Hound and Mirage are keeping guard over him. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget the Autobots kidnapped him last episode. Well, I guess kidnapped is a little too evil sounding. They captured him and stopped him from escaping. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, and he happens to have like this big old skeleton key that he's just waving around on his finger. It's silly, but it's a nice clear way to explain what happens next. So like <laughs> uh, Hound, Hound starts teasing Ravage. Oh, what was it? It's, it's, he says, uh, I don't think Ravage likes being a, pri a prisoner. And I did like this line as a kid. Mirage is like, well, I wonder why the Decepticons haven't tried to save him yet. And Hound's like, well, I don't care about anybody, not even their own. You know, that that's, a, I don't know. It, it's it's expositional, but it as a kid, it, it was like, it was a nice, clear definition. And when, I, when that line hit me, I thought back and I was like, yeah, he's right. They don't. Well, even they though, do. You Sound can tell in Soundwave's voice. Oh, he he was upset. Mm -hmm. He was upset, but he didn't want to go back and help his friend, right? It's like it's like it's like you're leaving your friend to get caught by by you know like the the, the school hall monitor or whatever. You're like, look, I'm sorry. I felt really bad about it, but I had to go. <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, somebody had to get away. I mean, there were what like f 14 Autobots there and one Decepticon that was successfully managing to escape. So. I wonder what Sergeant Slaughter would have to say. <laughs> That's all I got. We're not doing another podcast. We're not doing <laughs> WWSD. What would Slaughter do? <laughs> You're not going to cross the fandom streams and have Sergeant Slaughter quotes in here? Where he says, Falcon, we all go home or nobody goes home? Come on. 
But anyway, yeah, so Hound is like, now Hound takes it up a notch. Like, okay, well, I have so such a disdain for the Decepticons that I'm going to tease Ravage by making a hologram of Megatron who's just standing there. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your friend Megatron. Keep your company. And like Ravage like starts shouting at him. <laughs> <sighs> and all, all Mirage wants is, is Hound to make him a giant hologram house back on Cybertron so he can go on the Cybertron version of MTV's Cribs. <laughs> because all Mirage thinks about is home. I just want a big home on my home planet. <laughs> Where I can eat home fries. <laughs> uh, <laughs> everything to him is just with, it has the word home in it. Um, so, so anyway, when he's like, oh, holograms, it looks so real. Nobody would know the difference. Mirage, you just gave me a great idea. And he goes to Optimus. And Prime expands on Hound's little notion of an idea, but they don't fully reveal it to the audience so we can, like, play along with the, with the actions and see see it all play out. So mm-hmm. what Hound and Mirage do is they go back to Ravage's cage and they start talking about a rocket base. Yeah, the rocket base that's that's due west to the Autobots headquarters here. Also, he measures it this time in kilometers, which I thought was interesting because this was also like hot mm. off of the the movement in American schools to switch to the metric system. Did you say this? <laughs> yeah. It was like two years where we were like, oh, we're switching to metric. And then like the next year, like, no, we're not. Um, <laughs> so, I, yeah, like 140 kilometers due west of the Autobot camp, you know, uh, I, I noticed that because like, oh, they dropped mega miles. They're switching to metric, too. <laughs> yeah, they're not using mega miles on Earth. <laughs> the conversion is too crazy. <laughs> Turns out a mega mile is like 1.438947843218133 miles. So oh my god, like where's my abacus? A, yeah, it's too too <laughs> complicated. <laughs> So, so yeah, Hound just starts talking out loud, like, oh, there's this great rocket base where they got all this field to make, like, as many as four trips to Cybertron. And, and Mirage's like, oh, we can go home. Uh, and so let's go tell Ironhide, you know, and cheer him up. But what about Ravage? Ah, he'll be fine, Hound says, as he hangs the key on his hip where there's no hook. <laughs> and the key falls straight down to the ground. Uh, now, can we can we talk about how Okay, so like Ravage is by no means like one of my very favorite Decepticons, but he is an animal, and I love animals a lot. Um, and I also love when cute things happen, and I love that Ravage has this cute little arm that comes out of his arm. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got no opposable thumbs. You got to give the guy a break. But but yet he still manages to use the key like a key, right? Because like yep. he uses his little tiny arm that comes out of his wrist to get the keys, and then he like holds the key at his paw. And he looks at the camera like, "Ha! I got the key." <laughs> <laughs> And then he works the key in the lock and then he escapes. And like just, he does it like seconds after they leave. So they see him like mm-hmm. Mirage and Hound turn around like, it's Ravage. Mm-hmm. He's getting away. And they try to get him, but he gets away. Mm-hmm. And they go and tell Prime, oh, it's Ravage. He escaped. And Prime retorts, perfect. And the Autobots all make <laughs> the surprised Pikachu face, which is weird because I thought the whole plan was to let Ravage escape. So... Wouldn't they have been in on that? So shouldn't they? <laughs> right. I was I was trying to work this out because like this is clearly for the children, right? This is for the kids watching to be like, what? Did I, <laughs> Optimus evil? Because and I don't remember how I reacted to this when I was a kid, but like because I was trying to work out like what would be the rational reason for them to do that? Like, okay, maybe they thought somebody was spying on them. And then they wanted to look like this is authentic. But then Optimus wouldn't have said perfect. He would have been like, oh, rats, why did you guys let him go? Oh, he would have been such a useful hostage or something. But instead he's like, perfect. Well, that's tipping his hand that he was meant to be let go. So there was no point for them to be surprised except to, for them to basically telegraph to us, yes, kids, it is surprising that he said. <laughs> yeah, so Ravage gets away and he yeah. gets back to the Decepticons. And uh, first we see of him, he's inside Soundwave. In cassette deck mode. The rocket base is 140 kilometers due west of the Autobot camp. Excellent, Ravage! Excellent! So here he is in Soundwave as a cassette, and he's playing inside Soundwave, but he has like a gravelly voice. So I guess 
I mean, this is the only time we hear Ravage speak in anything other than growling. So mm -hmm. Ravage can speak, but only as a cassette. I mean, it seems like the the best option here would to have just been record Hound's Hound and Mirage's dialogue and just play it back. Yeah, but, which is what every other cassette does, right? right? Any anytime a cassette does this in the future, they always just replay what they heard. Mm -hmm. So it, I wonder if it was like done accidentally, like it, it, like the script says "ravage," but it was just supposed to be like the Hound's dialogue played before. So I don't know. It's either intentional, and they never touched on it again, or unintentional, and it was a mess up. But regardless, this is the only time we hear Ravage speak. And I. I like the idea of them being a, a direct recording device, but also like the tapes in them being sort of like their, their own memories. Right. Mm -hmm. So like they could recite in their own voices, but they have to be in tape mode to do it. Mm. I, I, I think that could have been a cool vibe to add to the show and add an extra layer of goofy weirdness to Soundwave, where he has these tapes and there's these two birds and this, this cougar, uh, he's a cougar or is he a Panther? I forget. No, Jaguar, Jaguar. He's Jaguar, that's right. They all just make animal noise, but when they're in tape mode, they talk in these creepy voices, but only when a or sound wave is in like cassette deck mode. I don't know. That just makes him even that more, much more weird. Like the Decepticon weirdo. And, I, and <laughs> the more and more we talk about, you know, I've never thought about sound wave that much. Even in all our years of talking about him, I've never thought that much of him except like, yeah, he's the guy that like all the dudes like because he's kind of cool and Boba Fettish and whatever. Mm -hmm. But oh, Boba Fettish, I never made that connection. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. Uh, that's but, our but, third like, podcast. <laughs> I'm sure it exists. Um, but like once we put it all together and spelled it out on this podcast and like thinking about how how strange he is as a character, I'm like, gosh, I kind of celebrate the weirdness of Soundwave more and more. Um, so yeah, the, this, this, this is even better to me now that you get like to hear Ravage's voice that one time and <laughs> Hey, he shows up in another cartoon later on, which we won't name. Oh, um, you must mean, and, uh, she were a princess of power. That's right. And, and we get to hear his voice then too. So, uh, anyway, so good work sound wave. Isn't that what Megatron says here? <laughs> so Ravage tells the gang all about the rocket base that he thinks exists and Megatron is pleased as punch. And Starscream actually tries to say something pleasant to Megatron, like, oh, we're doing pretty good now. But <laughs> Megatron isn't going to isn't gonna fall for this. He's going to blame all the delays on Starscream and causing the two to bicker, culminating in Starscream, having the cast iron manifolds to actually shoot at Megatron. Finally, he's putting his null ray where his mouth is. And rocket fuel is the last resource we need to defeat the Autobots and control Cybertron. Right on schedule, aren't we? No thanks to you, Starscream. I've made my contribution. You've also made clear your desire to replace me as leader of the Decepticons. Mistake number one. It's time for a change, Megatron. It's time for action, not words. I am the leader of the future. You couldn't lead androids to a picnic. How can you pretend to lead the Decepticons? Megatron! It's, it's empty! You failed to dispose of me when you had the chance, Starscream. Mistake number two. Now it's my turn. Please, don't fire. I, I, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done it. Please, don't shoot. Megatron! Megatron! We attack the rocket base at sunrise. That scene when when uh, you hear Soundwave say Megatron and start the scream shoots. Oh, there's a really cool it. little bit of animation. Yeah, this little bit of animation here is so good. Where Megatron just like flips around and he puts up like this weird square force shield. Yeah, that deflects the blast. Uh, it's it's really it's really well done. It's really pretty uh, and it's really like it's not much animation, but it's exciting animation. Mm -hmm. And the dialogue is fantastic. Yeah, but it, it, it's it's kind of an anticlimactic moment because Starscream is like doing a pretty good job of making his case of how how utterly terrified he is, and then Megatron just like kind of sh shoots him in the shoulder, like grazes him, it's a little like Nick. 
And I'm not sure what Starscream's doing when he's on his knees and he's like saying Megatron's name over and over again. <laughs> I mean, he seems to be begging for his life, but he, I, I guess he's he's just so shaken he can't he can't get the words out. He's just like Megatron, Megatron. <laughs> <laughs> and then Megatron looks up. He's like, all right, I did my awesome thing. So now I'm going to look at the camera and my eyes are going to glow. And I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to attack the rocket base at sunrise. Dun, dun, dun. And so we cut to this weird little valley in the desert. And Hound pops up over the ridge, mm-hmm. holds up his hand, and like everything glows. And then, boom, there's a rocket base there. And it's important to know that it looks like the sun has already been up for a little while. So, oh, okay. So Megatron... <laughs> wants to attack the rocket base at sunrise. So it looks like the Decepticons got there before the, the rocket base existed. <laughs> and the Autobots just slept in a little bit too long. And this is where Gears turns to Hound and the rest of the Autobots and says, you're late again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yes, Megatron climbs over the ridge and screams, attack. And then we get the crescendo of music and we go to commercial to learn about you know, Pogo Ball, and G.I. Joe Bridge Lair, and maybe Don't Tip the Waiter, uh, Pizza Party, um, some other exciting Parker Brothers toys. The Don't Tip the Waiter game comes with everything you see here. And then, and then we come back from commercial breaks while we're on the edge of our seats like, what's going to happen? <laughs> and we see all the Autobots in lab coats, cosplaying, as rocket base scientists, <laughs> presumably. This is this is a weird bit of animation here because like we don't see them in the lab coats before the commercial break. Right. And like th- we come back from commercial break and it just it starts right in the shot it left off on a Megatron screaming attack. He screams attack again and we see him use his back cannon for like the first and only time. Mm-hmm. Like that for you, back cannon everybody. He starts shooting at the base and then, like, while everything's exploding, we see Wind Charger and several other minibots running around in lab coats. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently they were dressed up as scientists, which is, like, also rocket base. Why is everybody in lab coats? <laughs> <laughs> Autobots don't know anything about subterfuge. <laughs> Here, put on white coats. That's what they do. Uh, Megatron will <laughs> think you're human. <laughs> So the Autobots don't know what they're doing, as usual. They thought they <laughs> no. could get one over on Megatron, but Megatron reveals that he knew it was a trick all along, especially when he got here and the hologram rocket base didn't exist yet because the Autobots were still asleep. And so the, Auto- the Autobots are engaging with the Decepticons and like they just start exploding, not mm-hmm. exploding with fire, but like, just like shatter. They just, like, they just fall to pieces upon first contact. And... One of them even has like a gigantic spring inside of them that goes. <laughs> so while the Autobots were asleep and not wanting to wake up early to concoct their plan, uh, the Decepticons had time to build fake Decepticons that could fall apart <laughs> after sixty seconds of battle. So you got to get up pretty early in the morning to get one over on Megatron. Quick cut over to Reflector. He's like, "Whew, I'm pooped." <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, it was all on him and Thundercracker to get the work done by morning. (laughs) But, yeah, so the Optimus looks around. We've been had. That's right, Prime. I was on your little scheme from the start. Did you really think you could fool me by allowing Ravage to escape? Did you? Go on, Megatron. You're in the driver's seat. While you and the other Autobots have been fighting a bunch of loose screws, the real Decepticons have been at the real rocket site. You've lost, Prime. The Decepticons have won. (laughs) The race isn't over yet, Megatron. Oh, it's over, Prime. You just don't know it. Shoddy workmanship, but they didn't need good workmanship. You know, they just needed something to keep the Autobots busy. And Megatron, being Megatron again, has to troll them by actually showing up to, like, wave his arms around mm-hmm. them. Like, ah Totally. Uh, so many times in, in the series, like, you just get to enjoy Megatron gloating over Optimus Prime and just, just like, rubbing rubbing his face in it that, that he failed miserably. 
he is so the 1980s bully, right? <laughs> like it's not enough to win, but he has to win and humiliate the loser, <laughs> you know? I bet Megatron drives a Camaro. <laughs> Well, I actually remember there was that one storybook uh, from around the same time where he was driving <laughs> a right. car and he was involved in a that's, big race. That's right. The Great Autobot Rally or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what I would give for a lost season of Transformers that was like the third season of Mask. <laughs> <where it's> <laughs> They're just, just racing around. <laughs> They're just trying to race. and this, uh, The Decepticons are always cheating. Uh, Megatron's like, it's my birthday and I want to win this race. <laughs> All right, so uh, so he takes off and leaving the, the Autobots there with a big mess to clean up. <laughs> and we cut to Cape Carlson Air Base. <laughs> Unidentified, uh, you know, planes approaching Captain, a lot of them. And this is this is another part coming up where, like, the, the fate of human life is left a little bit ambiguous in the show. Because the the Decepticons start landing, like, give us, give us your ID and a flight mission. Over, that's an order, you know. They're coming in fast, and then they sound the alarm, and the Decepticons transform and land. And then the troops come out and start shooting at them, and we hear Casey Kasem say to the commanding officer, our weapons are totally ineffective. There's nothing we can... And then it, you, it cuts to the Decepticons shooting up the base, and you just hear an explosion. So Did they survive? Who knows? Who knows? I make some energon cubes there, and they're already headed back to base. They're not wasting any time here. We got a ship... Uh, that apparently we've constructed off screen to fuel Mm -hmm. for the trip to Cybertron. Cut to reflector going, I'm (laughs) pushed. Good thing there's three of them. (laughs) That's why there's three of them. All the horrible tasks. Megatron's like, you ever see that movie Multiplicity? Let's just do that. (laughs) All right, so then we cut back to the Autobot base, and now things start to feel grim. Things are starting to feel really tense because we're coming up on the final act, right? Mm -hmm. And once again, it's like the typical miniseries status quo where the Autobots are at a severe disadvantage. I think Optimus says we've come to a moment of truth. We can't just stand around cosplaying as rocket-based scientists anymore. Apparently it doesn't work. (laughs) Look, we tried cosplay. That didn't work. And Winchard is like, no, I'm sorry. (laughs) So now we we have no choice but to confront them directly. But this battle would be most dangerous, so I ask for volunteers. And here's another thing that gets lost after this miniseries. He goes, Jazz? Mm -hmm. And then Jazz takes over. And volunteers, step forward. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. They're they're trying their best to have like a chain of command. And they're trying to be an army as hard as they can. And Jazz is doing a good job. But these guys are hard to keep in line. He can't always do what prime really needs but but here everyone is glad to help so they all step forward so they all volunteer even spark even plug spike. And spike yeah because they're good and we get another another iteration <laughs> second draft of optimus's iconic phrase <laughs> are we to transform and roll out yet no we're not but we get <laughs> let's roll <laughs> Let's roll. It's definitely a step up from let's get out of here. <laughs> but we're not quite home yet. So now we're at the point where, is this the scene where Megatron and Soundwave are riding the elevator together and Soundwave's giving him a status report on like, okay, we're like just about ready to blast off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a giant elevator that uh, takes them up to the entrance point of the rocket ship that they've built. Mm-hmm. But suddenly the Autobots show up. And in yeah. typical miniseries uh, fashion, they all square off for a while. So we see a couple characters battle. Then we cut to another couple characters battling. Then we cut to another couple characters battling. And all these characters are available at your local store, kids. Tell mom and dad right now. Always remember that parenthetically at the end of every scene is tell your parents, kids. <laughs> But, but, you know, it's like, I keep coming back to this. We were in on this. Like, you know, my mom and dad didn't buy me every Transformer. So what is it to you, you know, guy who noticed that this is a big commercial for toys? Mm Because I didn't get everything. I got a cool show out of the deal, though. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, advertise it to me all you want, as long as you make it good. Um, Anyway, uh, but, yeah, we get get some, like, callbacks with, like, Hound and Rumble Mm -hmm. going back to, like, oh, I owe you one from Sherman Dam. 
Also, some great, uh, some more Wally Burr grunts in this scene because when Hound finally squares off with Rumble, he like pins him against the wall, just starts punching him in the stomach. <laughs> And you get this cool, like, <laughs> while he's doing that. Those kind of stories about Wally Barr are legendary, about how he would need to get these sounds out of them. Like, okay, you're being beat up. Give me some sounds. Like, ugh, ugh. <laughs> He's like, no, you're really being beat up. Ugh, ugh. It's like, more, deeper. You're laying on your back while you're getting beat up. You know, no, not, not, now you're huddled into a ball. Now, now you're upside down. <laughs> no, more upside down sounding. But... But yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the crowd, anytime there's like crowd scenes of people making noises, I remember like hearing interviews that those were especially difficult scenes for them to do. Um, but yeah, so they, they're fighting and fighting. And then what, how does, how does everything, how does the, the, the retreat happen? Well, basically, um, as, as it usually happens, the, uh, the Decepticons get just enough of an upper hand to break away. And so they get to the ship. And the ship mm. actually takes off, and all the Autobots are left behind, causing Optimus to exclaim, <laughs> And speaking of Wally Burr pulling a performance out of someone, this is <laughs> one heck of a shout. <laughs> not not to uh cross the fandom streams too often but it, i i'm thinking of the scene from home movies when brendan small is asking jason to like make it bigger <laughs> i just wanted a better life for you and me and the baby no you gotta do it big gotta do it bigger it's a big line you gotta say it big <sighs> give it a shot i just wanted a better life oh, stop stop you gotta get bigger than that i just bigger, wanted bigger, a better bigger it's gotta be bigger than that bigger than that yeah. That's, should, it's bigger. Okay. Yeah. I just bigger. wanted a sorry, bigger. Sorry, sorry. Stop. 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 Bigger. Uh, bigger than that. Bigger. Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. Bigger. Let me hear you. Uh, Action. Ah! Ah! <laughs> Better life. Better life. Cut. So I, I've seen Peter Cullen being like, Megatron! You're like, no, nope, no, nope, bigger. You've heard William Shatner. Come on, you could do it. <laughs> and we get that titanic scream, um, which I do remember watching this as a child. I remember that moment feeling like, oh my gosh. And and I'm looking at the clock like the show's almost over. You know, this is as bad as it gets. The bad guys got away with all the energy. So uh, is this the next commercial break? Yep. And this is the last commercial of the episode, so it's that much more tense. We have the entire commercial run to worry about what's going to happen here. Honeycomb cereal, part of this big, complete breakfast. I don't care about the honeycomb hideout anymore. When you buy a McDonald's Happy Meal, you get one of four different Lego building sets. <laughs> I don't care about McDonald's Happy Meals. Cinnamon Toast Crunch cereal tastes like homemade cinnamon toast. A toasty part of this nutritious breakfast. Don't tell me any more about Cinnamon Toast Crunch. I got to know what happened to Optimus Prime. We know you eat what you like, Apple Jacks eaters. We get it. We know your cereal doesn't got, make any got sense. It. <laughs> so we come back from commercial break, and boy, what a, what a drag to, to start on. Yep, Jazz says it's over. Oh, that's it. We're done. Yeah, there was dust in their hands, like, you know, time to go back to the base and just, like, you know, think about how we failed today. <laughs> but let's, let's reflect on that whole cosplay incident because I'm, I'm really not done with that. I'm really thinking that's where the whole day went wrong. That was, I'm that looking at you, uh, Wind Charger. In the morning and still was like the whole, oh, it was, mm, Wind Charger, you're. And then Wind Charger speaks up from the back, and he's like, "Like, hey, failure's how you learn, guys." <laughs> uh, but no, but Optimus is like, "Yeah, well, I'm not gonna go back and contemplate failure just yet." It's over, Prime. We've lost. No, not yet. Sideswipe. Give me your rocket pack. My rocket pack? Now! Uh, yeah, right. This is crazy, Prime. You'll never catch it. I'll be back, Jazz. <laughs> and I love this moment because, again, this is not 
calm, wise Optimus Prime. This is still getting used to commanding all these yo-yos, Optimus Prime. This is the Optimus Prime that I love. Any any child of the 80s whose father or mother had to help them put together their Christmas presents for those who celebrated Christmas, this is the version of dad that Optimus is in this scene. <laughs> My rocket pack? No! <laughs> You got me up at 6 a.m. I haven't had my coffee yet. I'm happy that you're happy. <laughs> but for God's sake, stop contradicting me. <laughs> so he takes his rocket pack and he flies off after the Decepticons. And we cut back inside to the Decepticon ship. And you know Megatron is talking to the camera. He is gloating as always. He's like, yeah. And who... Who is always there to rain on Megatron's parade? Oh, it's Starscream. <laughs> so, of course, he's the one who points out that Optimus Prime is in their rear view mirror. Yeah. That's impossible. And then he's like, oh, there he is. I see him on the TV screen. So he's like, open the artillery hatch, and we just see like this giant gun pop out of the side of the <laughs> ship. And then he's like, fire. And the gun hits Optimus in the chest, and he goes spiraling down back spiraling to Spiraling down painfully, just and lest we forget the beginning of this episode opens up with prime rolling sideways down a hill this is prime's second painful crash to earth in just one episode poor guy less than 20 minutes yeah (laughs) now he got hit with like a a ship grade laser cannon in the torso and then falls miles out of the sky and let's remember in the first episode the ship grade laser cannons could delete a row of asteroids in front of them so That's right. pretty powerful cannons <laughs> that hurt that, that hurt and hurt. and starscream is is actually pleased for megatron <laughs> Yeah, he's like you got him wow you did it <laughs> and then megatron says we're going home our home oh cuz they own cybertron now yep. i get it <laughs> uh now I want I want to hang on that word home because it was, there's a surprise coming up in the episode. Did somebody and, and mention somebody home? Who... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this was like a Toy Galaxy video. Barrage's head really slowly rising in the lower right hand <laughs> side of the screen. <laughs> Whenever you say the word home. Okay, so yeah, we're going home. Our home, and the ship flies. We actually see the ship fly away as Optimus is falling to the ground. And then he hits the ground. It's not pretty. It's not like an elegant landing. Boom. Crash. But the Autobots are there to help him up. Thankfully, the Autobots apparently have some kind of uh, homing sensors that whenever they're going to crash, they crash nearby friends. (laughs) Maybe that is a piece of Transformers technology. Like, yeah, like the fall near friends (laughs) button on there. (laughs) I buy it. (laughs) <laughs> it's like life alert i've fallen and i can't get up <laughs> uh so so yeah you know they come running they come running up to him and they uh you know it's like don't don't move prime you know it's like you just you, you got hit with a ship grade laser and fell miles out of the sky hmm. don't move please and what does optimus do i'm fine i'm all right let ratchet check you out I said I'm fine. You did all anyone could do, Prime. I don't know. Maybe. Where's Mirage? That's strange. I saw him before, during the fight. He's gone now. I said I'm fine. Don't touch me. (laughs) I love Angry Prime so much. (laughs) That's right, you do. do. This is the last time we see him. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, uh, because even when he's fighting Megatron in the Ultimate Doom and in the next season, he's either being like noble, serious Prime, or he's being like jokey Prime, like fat chance, fat head, mm-hmm. you know. But we we never get like really. And I have to say, if I could just step aside the story just for a second and say, like, I'm not suggesting that Optimus should be like severely flawed or like Rodimus and have to develop more. But when you take away that anger, it, the stakes feel lower. If that makes sense. Mm. As a kid, it registered with me that, oh my gosh, he is so stressed out right now. It matters what's happening right now because he's so angry about it. I'm not saying I want Optimus to be yelling at his troops all the time. (laughs) I do. (laughs) But I'm saying that when he says, I said I'm fine, he's not trying to be a jerk. 
the Jazz, he's just super stressed out. Mm-hmm. He's under a lot of pressure, and it's showing. And I think that when they got rid of that, it it made the the story a little less serious to me. But as a little kid, I'm saying. Yeah, it became a bit more traditional good guy, bad guy cartoon. Like it, the good guys mm-hmm. never lost their calm. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, like in Super Friends, you you never you never hear Superman go, "Dang it, Batman! I said I'm fine." <laughs> right, right, yeah. Um, and, and I mean, there's going to that. It's like there's that iconic scene in Superman two when the the three villains from the Negative Zone are like using their super breath to knock down all the people of Metropolis, and Superman's like, "No, don't do it." The, oh no, they're holding a bus. They're holding a bus full of people, and they're gonna throw it. And Superman like looks seriously upset. He's like, "No, don't do it." The people, please. You know, he's like begging them almost. Uh, excuse you know, and like me, seeing... it's the Phantom Zone, not the Negative Zone. The Negative Zone oh, is my Marvel gosh. Comics. <laughs> Thank you for doing that before anybody else could. <laughs> <Hoover. laughs> so many you people were from... stopping the podcast and and going off to fire an email, and I just, I just shut that down right there. I could write a canned response in my Gmail that says, you clearly didn't listen to three seconds later. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but yeah, like there's something about that. But at the same time, to argue the other side, I'm also a big fan of the smiling hero who doesn't let the villain get under his skin, right? Zorro, like the the guy William Zorro. Mm-hmm. Um, Spider-Man, wisecracking all the time, yeah. which makes the villain like just... Like that kind of thing is, is super appealing too. So I'm not saying that I prefer one or the other. I'm just pointing out that you get different things when you do those two different things. Mm-hmm. And and what you get from this scene is as a kid, I felt like, oh my gosh, this matters that the bad guys won. Yeah. But Optimus bounces back pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And prime notices that of all the Autobots around Mirage is gone, which is kind of a weird <laughs> plot devicey thingy to notice considering all the Autobots aren't there anyway. So, but he notices specifically Mirage is gone. And the other Autobots <laughs> don't know where he is either. So we cut to the Decepticon ship. You can almost feel the childlike minds all wondering, hey, wait a minute, if Mirage is gone and we're cutting to the Decepticon ship, hmm. <laughs> but put a pin in that because Megatron thinks he's finally won and he's celebrating, <sighs> but... Who's the rain on Megatron's parade? It's Starscream. <laughs> that was the that was the theme song to Starscream seventy sitcom. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a, a spinoff of the Mary Tyler Moore show. <laughs> mm-hmm. His Starscream had to roommate with Reflector, and it was it was super annoying for him. Can I, I eat some, some of, of your checks, checks mix? mix? Ah, get out of here! <laughs> oh. Anyway, so Starscream tries to crush Megatron's dreams. What what is what is the line? Megatron's like uh, total victory is within my grasp, not yours, Megatron, mm-hmm. mine. There's a nice little piece of animation here too, where Megatron's got his hands on his hips and it's this forced perspective shot looking up at him, and we see all the other Decepticons like in a Wild West showdown, like backing away yeah. to not get hit by friendly fire. And what's what's also interesting is that Megatron has removed his fusion cannon. This is like casual on the ship, Megatron. Uh huh. Catch a lot of ship Megatron. Yeah, th- th- this is this is like uh, <laughs> after Thanksgiving when you unbutton your pants. Like Megatron right. has has taken the fusion cannon off. He's like, ah, I can rest my arm. <laughs> Not to be confused with Sunday Best Megatron, which is a different thing <laughs> yeah, altogether. That's a different variant. <laughs> yes. That's a e hobby <laughs> Japan exclusive only. <laughs> but yeah, he's like, oh, I see you've learned nothing, Starscream. And this is where we get to the the, the showdown, the, 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 the Titanic final. Mm-hmm. This is the last time we see these two square off. At last, total victory is within my grasp. Not yours, Megatron. Mine. <laughs> I see that you have learned nothing, Starscream. Wrong! I've learned a great deal. I won't miss this time. Beware, Starscream. If you dispose of me, there will always be someone waiting to dispose of you. Let them try. I've waited for this moment a long time, Megatron. And my time is now! Oh, such a great exchange, but it's interrupted by Mirage materializing out of nowhere. Remember, Mirage can 
do a little invisible thingy. Remember that little <laughs> rectangular prism that appears around him? Well, that's what he now did. Now you see me, now you don't. Yeah, and he snuck onto the ship. This isn't the, this isn't the only time he does this trick, too. Uh, there's actually, I want to say in uh, The Ultimate Doom, he pulls this stunt by sneaking onto the Decepticon ship <laughs> invisibly. Um, but but yeah, he, he pops up, and then, like, do Starscream and Megatron notice? No, they're consumed with their showdown. Yeah, Soundwave instantly detects him, though. Soundwave is always on point. Yeah. And he screams, Autobot Invader, and Starscream. Now, this is, as a younger person, and as it, it when I was younger and I was a big Starscream booster and I really thought that he was like the symbol of confidence. I don't think that now, <laughs> but uh, but I remember thinking like, notice everybody. He tries to shoot Mirage first. He doesn't take advantage of the opportunity to kill Megatron. He goes to the Autobot. Why? Because he's the greatest Decepticon patriot. <laughs> he, he he wants to take Megatron down because Megatron is a bad leader and he can do a better job. He's not doing it for self-aggrandizement, even though he talks that way. He's doing it because he really believes in the cause, right? <laughs> no, he's just he's just a goof, and he got distracted, and he just went, nah! <laughs> just shot in that direction. <laughs> And and uh, Mirage shoots up the ship computers. Mm -hmm. So now the ship is going down. And uh, Megatron, being the brilliant leader that he is, like just do something. <laughs> well, do something, Zachary. Do something. Well, he he fires at Starscream and pretty much puts him down. Yeah. He says, uh, "Extinction to all traitors." So uh, they've fired at Mirage and have taken out Starscream, but the ship is losing power and crashing down to Earth, erupting into flames like literally the, sh the ship is on fire. And ship this is, is on fire. Like the first time we ever see Megatron panic, he is literally panicking. Yeah. We have never seen this yeah. guy panic. Well, it, it, this goes back to that whole thing I was saying about Optimus being ticked off, is that this moment, when I was a child, it felt like, Oh, they're the bad guys, but like they experience fear too because mm -hmm. it cuts to Rumble yeah. and that cool cockeyed shot where the, everything's at an angle and we're looking up at Rumble and he's like all in that panicked pose. He says, "We're gonna crash. We'll be destroyed." Mm -hmm. You know, like he really, f you feel that this is really the end of these guys. Yep. Megatron, who's been on top of everything the entire miniseries, mm -hmm. is now begging his second in command to just do something. Yep. So yeah, as a kid, I remember this felt kind of scary, mm -hmm. you know. Even though it was the bad guys, I, I don't want them to die. I, I mean, they're, they're cartoon characters; they shouldn't have to die. Mm -hmm. And then, ship comes tumbling down, and and Mirage finds the exit door. <laughs> I'll say hello to to Prime for you, Megatron. Happy landing! Stop it! Yeah, so the ship is going down, but Mirage has escaped. He's got a little, uh, a little parachute. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 actually a cool design. I really dig how the parachute looks. But like when it hits the ground, and you hear it go like boom. I'm like, oh wait a minute, <laughs> how, how did that keep him aloft if it's like a big heavy metal thing like him? <laughs> but again, he drifts down to exactly where his Autobot friends are. <laughs> I never noticed this until you pointed it out. <laughs> yeah, anytime anyone falls, they fall directly to where their friends are. So, oh, pretty convenient. That's, pretty great. that's great Autobot technology. Mm -hmm. And so they all go, "Yay!" Yeah, the, you stop the, the, the Autobots see the ship crash into the ocean first, and then they, of course, declare that the Decepticons are finished because they're underwater, and that means finished. <laughs> and they wonder how that happened. And then they see Mirage parachuting down. Yeah, the Decepticons are gone. Our path is clear now. Mm -hmm. Oh, it must have been a mechanical failure that caused their ship to crash. And then Prowl says, I don't think it was a mechanical mm -hmm. failure, Jazz. Look. Mm -hmm. There's that military strategist. He knows he can <laughs> strategize when he looks at things and says, oh, <laughs> look. Check out that great strategy I just concocted that must have been Mirage because Mirage is parachuting down. Just like I said, and he dusts his hands and walks away. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and everybody cheers. And then Optimus, you know, is, is relieved that the one Autobot he was missing is there. And he says to him, 
We knew you were anxious to get back to Cybertron, but at least you could have waited for us. Sorry, Prime. The ship was full. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Mirage. Uh, I hate that line. I hate that line so much. <laughs> Sorry, Prime. The ship was full. <laughs> yeah. It's like he's, he chuckles. He, it's like he's had that line the entire time he was parachuting down. He's like, "Oh, I can't wait to spring this one on Optimus." It's not funny. <laughs> the ship was full. I haven't thought about this line very hard. Uh, I, I, I don't advise that you do. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's how I read it as a kid, because like I noticed, like I don't know if your parents ever had like dinner party guests over but my parents did occasionally when i was a little kid so like there would be these nights when there's all these grown-ups in our house and they're talking about stuff and i don't know what they're talking about but they're all laughing at it like my my dad said something about you know uh he was telling some joke you know and i don't know the context of the joke i don't know what it's referring to <laughs> but he just says this line and it ends with like and then the belt fell down and everybody goes yeah yeah they all laugh <laughs> And so, like, I felt like it was like that. It was like, oh, they're talking like grown up. <laughs> the ship was full. Apparently, that means something to, to like grown up Autobots. But I, as a kid, I don't get it. <laughs> like the ship was <sighs> full after Mirage got on, so no other Autobots could get on. I guess that's the joke. But <laughs> thankfully, they knew to have the, the Autobots react that it was a groaner, and they're all like, ah. Uh, uh. <laughs> So now the Decepticon newly crafted ship has crashed into the ocean. So mm -hmm. obviously they're totally defeated because the Decepticons, even though they're indestructible, they uh, disperse in water. They're like bath bombs. They just sort yeah, of that's, fizz, that's fizz right. away <laughs> and they're gone. I would remember this the next time a friend of mine falls into a pool, I'd be like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> He's just gone now. He's gone. <laughs> Oh, I'll remember him. So since we the Decepticons are totally defeated, Prime <laughs> thinks it's time to repair the Ark and to go home. Yeah. Let's go back to base. we got a ship of our own to repair. Let's get out of here. I mean... <laughs> roll. Let's roll. Uh, I don't know. Uh, roll for it. Uh, but Spike says, Can I go back to Cybertron with you? <laughs> Now, in my in my little head cannon, Prime knows there's no oxygen on Cybertron, <laughs> and and he's just okay. waiting to go back and watch yeah. Spike enjoy this great new planet he's heard all about. But no, Prime's yeah. not Prime's not evil like that. Maybe only in some of no, my he... stories. So <laughs> Prime, <laughs> you're, Prime, you're head cannon. even Prime with no clue about Earth customs is like maybe you should ask your father. Maybe you should stop asking me things. I'm not your dad, Spike. <laughs> I'm not even your president. <sighs> Quit writing your dumb diary. <laughs> you think you think this is like the moment when, in that uh, Saturday Night Live skit when William Shatter said to all the Trekkies, <laughs> you know, get a life. Like this is this is Optimus saying to all the fans preemptively, ask your own father. <laughs> don't look to me. No, I don't think so. I, here's how I'm. This is my head cannon. Mm. Optimus is very observant and he cares about everybody. And so he noticed that there's this deference between Spike and Sparkplug. And Spike calls Sparkplug something other than spark plug he doesn't call him and if he doesn't call him spark plug right so he asked he's like hey spark plug how come spike talks to you different and spark plug explained to him the whole concept of family and fatherhood and Optimus like oh okay <laughs> uh -oh, uh, what? Oh, i'm sorry i think i just blacked out in the most boring fanfic ever <laughs> So uh, it's rss.jdros.com. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to hear more of my thoughts on the wholesome benefits of family and friendship in the Transformers canon. Uh, so, but yeah, like uh, Spike's like, can I go too, Dad? And he's like, only if I can go with you. So everybody's going back to Cybertron. <laughs> and Austin's like, all right, well, let's head for home. And he delivers his famous line, finally, which finally. is... Autobots, transform! Oh. Uh, he was close. He's getting there. He's slowly it's a work inching in progress. towards it. But this time he just said, Autobots, transform. And, 
And Autobots transform and remain idle and neutral. Can can we t- talk about like the really pretty like s- like soft sad goodbye music that's happening mm. here? <laughs> but it's it's the Transformers theme played in like this like slower minor key, and it's like it's and we're watching all of them trans. And I, remember, we had no promise of a series, mm-hmm. so when they're all when we're, they're watching each Autobot transform and roll by the camera yeah, and then we see this, like how for all we know this is our goodbye yeah and so like just that scene where like hound rolls by and spike and spark plug jump jump in him um and then we see mirage go by and sunstreak and i'm like yeah this is like and and i'm along for this ride and, I, and at this point i've all my chips are pushed into the middle of the table i'm like yeah give you know i'm here for you transformers <laughs> please give me more of this is this is this the last one? Oh man i don't know what to do with that you know, and then we get the, the the transition of the Autobot symbol to Autobot symbol because the Zeppelins are gone. Remember, they're in water now. <laughs> yeah, and and we <laughs> and we go to the Autobot base, and sure enough, they're fixing the arc. Yeah, we see like eight oil tankers pulled up and gassed to the <laughs> arc. Like there's like a tube, a presumable like it's like a gas pump. <laughs> It's like just <laughs> filling up the ark with gas or something, presumably gassing up the ship so we can leave Earth. Yep. And uh, they're all like, ready, Spike? Because we're all going to leave because we're leaving Earth because the Decepticons just d- dissipated into the sea. <laughs> well, don't forget, we also get one last journal entry. Oh, of course. In Spike's diary. And he's like, you know, the, uh, all the governments of the world have agreed to give Optimus the energy he needs to revitalize Cybertron. And he says, probably the first time all the governments ever agreed on anything. And see, wholesome cooperation, friendship, family, good values. That's the Autobots. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's time to, to blast off. And Optimus says, all right, you know, uh, what, what, what is it? Like, there's a last, last entry from Earth, next stop Cybertron. Yep. Is that pretty much it? Yep. And then we cut to the bottom of the ocean. Enjoy this while you can, everybody, because this is the last time where we're going to get that cool animation where the characters look like they're underwater because <laughs> they actually like use like you know duotone coloring scheme. Mm-hmm. And we see the ship, and we hear some tense music. Uh oh, that tense music. It's got to be telling us something. We see Megatron emerge from the ship. And he swims up to the surface. He's not dead after all, kids. What does that mean? For all we know, all the other Decepticons are. Because for some reason, like for the next couple ending cliffhangers, Megatron is apparently the only character who survives. <laughs> but the, like everybody's back after that. <laughs> but but yeah, he like I, I think it's a pretty cool ending. Uh, him swimming up to the surface and just becoming like a little silhouette of a character, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. He doesn't fly. He doesn't swim at us. He swims away from us. And where's he going? Mm-hmm. I don't know. We but don't he's know. out there. We're left with just enough questions to where we want more. But this is the last episode of the miniseries. What happens now? Our coverage will continue next week for episode four. Transport to Oblivion. Oh, man, that's surely the last episode. <laughs> it says Oblivion so clearly. <laughs> They're going to continue to overpromise, uh, but yes, episode four of the series, episode one of the proper first season. Mm-hmm. So, any any final thoughts, reflections, uh, wrapping up our exploration of the first miniseries? Well, it was great. It was fantastic. You know, how could this not be ordered straight to series? It was such a great three parter. There's not a lot of three parters in Transformers. Dumb. Well, I would. I think there's only two others. Uh, but mm. but man, they really hit it out of the park with their initial one. Considering they had so many characters to introduce. Mm-hmm. I mean, so many guys, and yet we all sort of have the gist of everybody, and what we don't know just sort of makes us want to see more. So, well done. I will say this. I think we talked about in the first episode, the, the, the episode about episode one of the series, is that there was a seriousness about this that didn't exist at the time in a lot of the other action adventure cartoons. Even mm. G.I. Joe. Yeah. G- the first G.I. Joe miniseries is peppered with humor. There is a lot of humor in that series. And the humor even gets more and more wild as the series goes on. Like once you get to Shipwreck and Polly, it's like, okay, well, this thing is like 
crazy town now. We can have like <laughs> sentient talking animals who can grow into giant birds and like save sky strikers <laughs> and things like that. It just gets it gets goofy after a while. And then don't even get me started on the Deke series. But but this miniseries, like it's not very funny. Like there's not a lot of humor in it. I, I would say actually I don't think there's any humor in it, really. Um, well, well don't forget my really funny <laughs> joke about the ship being full. I worked hard on that one. <laughs> I worked up that for months <laughs> at the Chuckle Hut in Dave's Laugh House. Uh, no, but I mean, like, there isn't like a whole lot of stuff that is clearly designed to be funny. Like the whole right. series, it's the, presented the, the very thing seriously, I, very earnestly. Yeah, and as an eleven year old, I was like super into it. Like I felt like, oh, this is like grown up cartoon. I shouldn't be watching this. Like it had that vibe to it, mm-hmm. which I think is like an important thing for kids that age to experience. Like you get right. something that's just above your level. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I remember I was I was like thirteen when I read like Bill Willingham's Elementals, mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh, I shouldn't be reading this. You know, right. which made me want to read it all the more. Yep. So like I, but in retrospect, it's like now that I look at it, and especially having had many iterations of the series since then, which have had varying degrees of humor, it's like, huh, I kind of wish it was a little bit funnier now. <laughs> but but at the same time, it's like I get like what it was doing, and I feel like uh, I wouldn't call it perfect. Let me just put it that way. But I love it sincerely and deeply. I have so much affection and fondness for this miniseries, but. Mm-hmm. Um, the grown up in me who's always looking for something cute and lovable in my adventure entertainment is like, would it kill you to make me laugh, Transformers? <laughs> <laughs> so. Did you say you wanted to laugh? I have some more jokes I'd like to share with you. <laughs> oh, I like that we're coming up with this whole like new fandom of our, uh, what do you call it, fanon of, yes. of Mirage being <laughs> a failed stand up comic on Cybertron. Oh, man. So I guess if people want to send us their fan art of Mirage in front of a brick wall, <laughs> uh, they can send it to four million years later at gmail.com. <laughs> All right. So is that it? Did we do a show? I think we did a show. We we were very pleased by this miniseries and we're ready to kick off the first season proper. All right, so in the immortal words of Optimus Prime, let's get out of here. <laughs> so <laughs> I have been Jersey Drozd of jdrozd.com and 4millionyearslater.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I have been Hoover, but I don't know if I'm from the past or the future, but I'm here now. And you have real feelings. And I have real feelings. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash Nicholas dash Mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4 Million Years Later.com, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>